I've got a lot of respect for health economists and for economists generally. To be fair, they've predicted nine out of the fast, fast, past five recessions. Uh, I want to talk to you about the Partners Programme, which is the procurement of affordable replacement therapy, network of European relevant stakeholders. You've no idea how long it took us to walk on that acronym to make it fit. So the EHC, uh, we do a detailed survey every three years of the state of haemophilia care in Europe, looking at every aspect of comprehensive care and treatment. In fact, I'd encourage you to call to the EHC stand because there's a really nice colour pullout showing this that you can take with you if you're short of time to buy gifts to, br to bring home to your family. It's really nice. Um, so we look at every aspect of treatment and care. Uh, and we've realised in looking at this over the last nine years that there are really countries fall into three distinct groups. Uh, on the top we have countries in blue here who historically have had the greatest access to treatment. They've got the highest GDP, they're using the highest per capita amount of factor, and treatment has been progressing very nicely. In the middle we have a group of countries who are improving access, their economies are improving, and access to human fiduciary is, is constantly improving and evolving. And then on the, on the bottom left-hand side, countries with the lowest GDP, and really they are stuck in the situation where they have not been seeing the improvement in care and access to replacement therapy that many of the other European countries have. And we are real concerned that with novel products and new treatments and the exciting landscape, that they would again be left behind. So the entire purpose of this program is to try and move those countries up to where uh, a lot of the other countries are without obviously changing the country's GDP per capita, which we can't influence. And what are the barriers? When we look at these countries, a lot of these countries are very low factor use, and why is this? Well, cost economics is an obvious barrier. Haemophilia care is seen as very, very expensive in these countries. Reference pricing. So a company may be unwilling to go in and sell in some of these countries at a lower price because of reference pricing, because then the Western European countries may want the same price. A lack of or an ineffective national tender or procurement process. Haemophilia isn't just about economics, it's also about organisation. In many of these countries, they don't have a good procurement process. Lack of involvement of the clinicians and the haemophilia society in tender procurement processes. If these processes are run entirely by health officials uh, or insurance companies, then they really don't see the requirement to keep improving treatment because they're not directly affected by the condition. And one-year budget cycles and tenders. And in a lot of these countries, the governments think in one-year terms. There's no long-term planning, so there's no sustainable improvement. And our proposed solution was really these countries need a real and sustainable increase in the amount of replacement therapy they have available at an affordable cost. So we decided to look at criteria and to get around the whole concern about reference pricing to, to include countries in a programme if they met these defined criteria. And then for these countries, uh, pharmaceutical companies would agree to provide factor eight and factor nine below a ceiling price, which we set at a very, very significantly lower than the median European price. Procurement would not be for a one-year term, it would be for three years. And the countries would have to purchase more than the current amount. So we, are, we have absolutely no interest in helping countries to get more treatment where if they, if they decide to save money and then give it to the army or roads or, or something else. So basically the budget cannot be decreased, it must be maintained or increased. But our, our idea is to allow them and help them to get significantly more factor concentrate for the existing budget. And the, the criteria we used are based on the EDQM Council of Europe recommendations, which incidentally used a lot of the EHC survey data in compiling these recommendations. And the four recommendations we used were that the minimum consumption of factor eight concentrate in any country should be four IU per capita, 0 0.5 IU per capita for factor nine, and that national or regional tenders for factor concentrates are encouraged and should always include both haemophilia clinicians and the patient organization. And prophylaxis for children with haemophilia is already recognized as the optimum therapy. So when we looked at countries who were lower than four IU per capita for factor eight, less than 0.5 for factor 9, where not all the children are on prophylaxis and where they don't have, where they have a national tender procurement process, uh, uh, but, but the patients and doctors are not included. Countries which fit all or, or some of those, uh, we, we identified 14 countries initially who were eligible for, the, for inclusion in this program. And so progress to date, we've had visits or detailed discussions with 12 of the countries to meet with the health ministry, the clinicians and the haemophilia society. 
Um, we have a project consultant, Declan Noon, who's really doing a detailed scoping exercise on the current tender and procurement system in each of the countries and identifying their individual barriers and opportunities. Um, we've established an advisory board with participation from the pharmaceutical companies who have signed up for partners, Kedri and Sobi and probably Pfizer. Um, we've made major progress in several countries. Uh, we have the first countries of agreed participation, Albania and the Kyrgyzstan Republic, and we are very, very close to signing an MOU with the Ministry in Macedonia, and there's been significant progress in other countries such as Ukraine. I'll say also that we've had very good discussions with other companies this week, and we are hopeful that in the coming months we may well be able to announce additional companies who are signing up for this. The momentum generated by partners has also led to changes in some of these countries. So we're already seeing that the fact that this program is happening, the fact that this should lead to a larger supply at a lower cost for these countries is impacting those countries and other countries around them so that already companies are feeling that they must offer more value uh, in terms of haemophilia products to these countries. So we're seeing lower prices in several countries already. Serbia are now moving to a two-year procurement initially. They've, they've strengthened their tender board to include the haemophilia side in clinicians. Um, they're close to four EU per capita for factor eight. Progress is being made in Latvia and Turkey. In Ukraine, um, the health ministry uh, brought in the UNDP, the United Nations Development Programme, to run their tenders, and the UNDP have signed an MOU with the EHC to help them with those tenders, and there's now a new inclusive procurement process under development there. So there are benefits to this. This, this programme is a win-win for everybody. There are definite patient benefits. They get an immediate increase in access, planned progress on a national level, more product choice, and face time between the society and the health ministry on a regular basis, which is really important. They'll have a key formal role in the development of haemophilia care uh, and more transparency. And, and the fact is that it's really getting the clinicians and the patient organisations involved in tender board, which will drive sustainable improvement in care in these countries in the coming years. There are obvious benefits for the clinicians, better treatment protocols, access to surgery, prophylaxis or ITI. There are pair benefits. They get transparency on national spending and procurement, improved stock control, significant increase in access, and greater predictability of budgets, which hospital finance directors always like. And they'll have the optimum choice of products chosen by experts. For the pharma companies, there'll be certainty on volumes of factor to be purchased, a significant increase in volumes purchased, Yes, the cost per unit may be significantly lower, but if they're buying a larger amount over a three-year tender rather than one, that's still a much bigger market. And that's also fulfilling part of their duty of social responsibility. The product selection must comply with national and international regulatory requirements. It will be an open tender, and I stress that the programme isn't just available to those companies who have signed up to work with us on this. Any company can tender, but they must tender below the ceiling price that we have established. Uh, and then, in terms of, uh, there are issues we're dealing with, parallel importing issues. We really don't want to see a situation where one of these emerging countries uh, buys factor concentrate and the distributor there then resells it to Germany at a profit. So we're, get, we're, we're, we're looking at ways to get around that and to prevent that. Um, also, home delivery si systems for tracking and tracing of factor uh, and, and distribution around the country. Uh, we have, we're having a lot of operational discussions. This concept is simple, but the implementation is very complex because there are, there are difficulties and issues in each country that we're working through in terms of the length of contracts, product registration issues, which centre will be responsible for home treatment, volume increases and guidelines, and, for example, under which auspices does the tender board actually operate. Uh, so this is an example of... It's not, it's not just about money. Romania has a decent budget now for haemophilia care, but they have 38 separate tenders for factor eight. Now, that's not efficient. And that also means that they're buying smaller amounts and they don't have expertise in buying them at 38 locations of Romania. So you can see that if they had one national tender, it would be much more effective and efficient. An example of partners in Albania, in 2016 they used 2.5 IU per capita, year one of the partners programme that will increase to 4 million units at no additional cost, and years two and three, a three-year contract for 16.5 million units uh, with a very small increase in the budget. So I think that this programme is changing the future. 
I think the market is changing with more standard half-life products, extended half-life products on the market, novel products coming in the market, more and more competition. I think we're, we're naturally going to see more competition and lower prices for the products which have been around for quite a long time. I think this programme helps to drive that change and make it available to those countries. Uh, I think we do not want to see a situation where we're sitting here in four years' time where we've got access to these wonderful novel products, and yet in these European countries, that they're still look at a situation where they're below the Council of Europe minimum, uh, and access to treatment must improve at a faster pace. If I was to mention the one thing that we're seeing as an obstacle, it is the people who are unwilling or unable to think outside the box. We've been doing it this way for a long time, or I'm a local official or insurance company or hospital doing my local tender. I don't want to lose control of this. And that's why we're not going in and walking at a low local level. We're going right into the health ministers. They see the compatibility of this programme, and then they walk downwards to make sure it works in each country. And I think that this programme will help countries to increase access to treatment by assisting also with their organisation of care and with their economic viability of procurement. And I want to acknowledge Declan Noon, who is visiting all these countries constantly for us, Amanda Bach, our CEO, Miranda Cole, our lawyer from Covington, who's doing this tremendous work for us pro bono, and the companies who have signed up, and also the health ministers, officials, doctors, and haemophilia societies in those countries. Thank you.